Oh, welcome and uh, please go forward. I'll let Jen do it because you, a lot of you know Jen. She can she can at least introduce it. And then I and then I do have a presentation and um, I mean I. I can go through it and you can have questions after or you can have questions in between. I just, you need to give me like what an outside one would be or which way we'd prefer, but go from there. Uh, okay, so I will introduce John Raganese, who is the manager of our relicensing. Um, he is the manager of FERC uh, compliance and relicensing for Great River Hydro. Um, as you probably all know, we have been going through this relicensing process of three projects on the Connecticut River. Um, the going from south to north, Vernon, um, Bellas Falls, and Wilder. Um, <clears throat> the whole process started in October 2012. Um, we filed our amended uh, final license application in December of 2020. In that application, we included um, a proposed uh, operations plan, licensee proposed plan. And John's gonna go through that. Um, and now we're in the post application timing for this whole relicensing process. We had a pre-application timeframe, supposed to be about two years. Obviously it was a lot longer than that. Um, and then the post application filing, which is about two years. So with that, I will hand it over to John and let him uh, do his show. Thanks, Jen. And thanks everybody for the invite. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever, I mean, I've spoken to local river advisory people many years ago, but I think it was like a group at a at some of our presentations that we might have had a while some of you had participated or or, or so um i would say things have i guess we, i can't say we've come a long way but it's been a long time ago <laughs> let's put it that way um because it just seems like it takes forever sometimes um i do have a few slides and i'll i'll throw them up because they just might give you something to you know follow along um as well um and I got to make sure I, I usually when I'm running these, so I usually I can share my screen. Let's see. Let's do that. Let's put this on presentation mode. Let's see if that works. Oops, that's not going to work. Um, hold on a second. This always screws up when I do it like this. Get out of that. All right, I'm just going to do it. You'll see the um, you'll see the slides on the uh, you know sort of like the uh, the tab on the side here. Can everybody see um, the like a first slide type of thing? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. And can you hear me? All right, everybody. Um, that works. Okay. Yep. Good. Awesome. Yep. Um, okay, so what I just I, I, what I was hoping to just maybe cover, and you and and I would say just ask questions if I'm not covering something or whatever. Um, but what I thought I would just largely do was just um, do uh, just a you know a synopsis of what um, is in our recent well I say recently filed December filed uh, application really focus primarily on the operation elements of that. Um, and I'll touch on the other elements that are listed. Uh, I don't have a lot of detail. I want to necessarily, I, I don't have slides and everything else for that, but I would be happy, happy to answer questions. And then um, I think I have one slide that is sort of on like all the next steps. And so if there's questions about that, I might, um, I might uh, refer back to that as well, or we can refer to that. Um, so uh, without reading this or anything, you know, we have three projects that are all on the same timetable, same deadlines um, that are what we know, what we call the Lower Connecticut River projects. And that's Lower Connecticut for Great River. I know that other people, people think of Lower Connecticut as being, you know, Connecticut or, or, or Massachusetts, but um, if you ever see me reference it or call it that way, I'm really just talking about these three projects. And that's, um, 
uh, as opposed to the uh, upper Connecticut, which is like 15 mile falls and our storage reservoirs that are uh, up at the Connecticut lakes. So um, these applications that went in as amended applications in uh, uh, December largely sort of filled in the blanks that were, were you know, blatantly uh, obvious in the initial application we filed. Um, and it's because the initial application was filed to meet a statutory deadline, but we actually hadn't even finished all of our studies. So we were we had to file something uh, by statute. Um, and then, um, you know, I guess, you know, legally or stat from a statutory standpoint, we didn't have to amend it, but it made sense to amend it because we had engaged quite a bit of um, of uh, effort into uh, looking at a uh, uh, potential for proposed alternative operation. And so that's what's largely uh, reflected in that application. And then since that application has gone in, as Jennifer said, we're sort of in this post-application mode where we're responding to various uh, additional pieces of information that FERC is looking at to make sure they understand what our application is, or there may be um, some, some information or some materials that they feel um, we, we did not include and we should include. So we're, we're addressing that uh, now. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, let's just see, I think I got these out of order. So here's the first one. <laughs> uh, no, where I'm missing one. Where did it go? <laughs> well, I had one here. Um, that's funny. I definitely had a slide. So I apologize. So uh, I had sort of a little synopsis slide, um, and it's not, it's not, I guess, yeah, this is it. I'm sorry. Um, so we have, I, I, I basically recall there are four sort of sectors in the, in the revised application, or the amended application that I'll, that I'll mention. And the, the primary one is our revised operation, where we're uh, proposing a very different uh, sort of, uh, you know, fully flexible operation to one where we're actually um, really trying to pass uh, inflow the majority of the time. Um, we're also putting some flows in the bypass at Bellows Falls down at the dam below Wilder, um, which were never um, uh, specified or, you know, uh, provided other than um, a, uh, leakage or, or, or spill when high flows occurred. Um, excuse me. Um, we are continuing the, our high water management um, that we have in our current application or current license. And um, we're continuing to provide uh, ISO New England responsiveness uh, because we are one of the critical energy um, type facilities, fast start facilities in New England. And a lot of this responsiveness is what really provides uh, the, back, the backup or the insurance for a lot of the variable energy renewables like solar and wind. Um, uh, then there are provisions and will our provisions for uh, addressing fish passage improvements uh, and our ladder operations. And we're in the midst of trying to iron, iron out the, a little more of the detail on those, um, but they largely are, are centered around sort of up and downstream passage uh, for uh, your diadromous uh, species of American shad, American eel and sea lamprey. And then um, uh, we have uh, existing recreation facilities uh, we've outlined in more detail and, and primarily in, after we put in the application with more detailed uh, sort of timing and uh, uh, estimated expenditures for impro making improvements at uh, facilities or enhancements at our existing facilities. And then we also did the same thing. We outlined a little more specificity in terms of um, sort of timing and our resources that might go towards uh, uh, cultural and historic resource, either continuing investigations uh, or uh, potential uh, support for, you know, traditional information, tribal information, uh, outreach uh, activities, et cetera. And this is largely going to be, would be encompassed in a couple of, uh, of uh, documents that follow um, as part of the application uh, once FERC accepts it. Um, and so uh, I'll, let me just go uh, on and begin to talk about uh, which I believe perhaps is the most um, uh, the most significant uh, element of our application as is our 
proposed operation. And it's, it's probably the most complicated. So I would say um, uh, I'm going to run through it kind of quickly, uh, but, but, but ask questions now, because otherwise we may, you know, you may have one question that gets answered. And if you didn't answer, you'd ask five more. So that's, let's just go that route if that's okay. So the, the essentially, and I, and I, I, sometimes I break it into three, sometimes I break it into just four, uh, into four, but there's, are essentially, um, uh, let's just say for the sake of uh, discussion here, there's four modes or elements associated with our uh, proposed operation. There's the primary one, which in, in which we're trying to pass um, uh, the outflow below each of the three dams is uh, instantaneously trying to match the inflow. Um, then there are uh, times when um, we have discretionary flexibility. In other words, we would deviate from that inflow equals outflow largely to have higher discharge in response to um, uh, energy needs, energy demands, uh, price signals, whatever, whatever way you want to call it. They all, they all align themselves uh, to the same hour. And these are limited uh, periods of time by hour in by, by hours per month. Um, not the same number of hours in each month, and I'll talk about that a little bit further, but, um, but are largely distributed, I guess, across the 12 months in a year in a way, in a manner in which largely aligns with potential resource uh, impacts that, that um, uh, many folks feel are associated with, um, uh, you know, fl uh, rapid flow changes, um, uh, water surface elevations, mostly flow, but water surface elevations as well. Um, then there are transition operations. And, and the reason why I said earlier that there's kind of three, because you wouldn't do any transition operations if you didn't have a flexible operation. And transition operations are really what I'm, what I speak of is we, we, we will do things before we before the hour that we're going to fully, you know, discharge uh, the the schedule that we want for meeting a energy demand, and then there's so I, we would call that sort of up ramping. So we would we would bring the flows up to that uh, high flow that we wanted to do in that particular hour, and then um, the other side of the transition would be we would um, reduce flow um, as well as because both the up ramping and down ramping and the flexible operation itself are all going to be essentially above what inflow is, the, the impoundment will go down in terms of the, the elevation. So there's a fourth transition or, or another transition uh, period, which is basically trying to refill the reservoir back to um, uh, a target elevation. And the target elevation is really the way we're going to largely monitor and pass inflow. Um, we'll, uh, I'm just going to close the door here for a second. Um, I'm sorry, I have a puppy and Jennifer often sees the puppy jumping into my lap and you'll see a big head right here. <laughs> I decided to spare you tonight. Um, uh, so that transition has is up ramping, down ramping, and then a refill. And then lastly, uh, we would say this is more of this ISO New England responsiveness, where um, they call us when there may be a reserve shortage, or they're looking for us to particularly operate to maintain voltage or um, some kind of stability on the um, power grid. Uh, we have the capability of doing that um, uh, very fast and very in small pieces, uh, very quickly. So um, we're we're that that sort of fast response that we talk about in terms of potentially, you know, if uh, I don't know, like the wind suddenly stops, they look for resources to be able to backfill um, uh, a lot of variable wind, uh, or if a power plant, you know, trips off or something like that. Um, the 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 power grid has to have some kind of capability of sort of backfilling that void, or I often refer to it, or my analogy is sort of loss in pressure. Um, so we're sort of like the, uh, you know, the, the, the apply pressure to the wound kind of thing that we don't need to do it forever, 
but you need to do it really quickly uh, to be effective. So that's that that fourth uh, bullet there. And then, as I said, and, then and as it, I said, we just then as I said, we have a minimum flow in the bypass. So um, any questions? I do have like a little more specificity on each one of these, if you if that we can talk about. But uh, go ahead and ask questions. Somebody want to speak? In a typical year, uh, the can you go back one? Uh, sure. The emergency. In yeah. a typical year, how many times are there an emergency? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it depends really. We, we don't have, um, it's, first of all, these are not huge emergencies. They're not like massive um, operational changes. They can be five seconds long. Uh, they can be five minutes long. They could be an hour long. They're rarely not more than an hour. And, and oftentimes we don't actually know if we're being dispatched on an emergency for an emergency. In other words, one of the one of the important capabilities that we had to preserve, which is what is in continued responsiveness or emergencies, is um, is uh, w w there may be an emergency, but we actually don't get dispatched. We're like the last straw on some emergencies. They want to use a resource that they can, knowing that we have the like the the, the most um, you know, sort of the last with the last last ditch insurance plan, and so they may posture us and say we're in an emergency mode, but they actually don't do anything. They just know we're there, and so those often count as emergencies when you look at the data, but we actually don't do anything. So when we looked at some of the um, the the data that the ISO New England has is not ours. Um, we saw about 120 emergencies throughout all of New England. We tried to pa pare those down into our area. And I think we came up with, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40. We don't even know if we were even dispatched on any of those, but they're, they're not, they're not, a, they're not, they're not long and they're not, um, they're not massively significant. They could be, I guess, if it was a blackout, then we would be the first ones to try. We, our, all of our hydros would be the first ones bringing the power back on in New England. We're, we're, we are those, we are those resources. But that's not really the kind of emergencies I'm talking about. This is more about um, when a hot summer day, um, they anticipated load to be at a certain um, amount on the grid. Uh, it was hotter than they thought, a nuclear plant tripped, uh, uh, middle of winter, super cold, the gas that was supposed to be going to a gas plant to run for electricity, uh, the gas was, was better utilized for home heating and price, you know. So those are the kind of where demand is often um, not matching up with the anticipated um, uh, uh, schedule. And so there are reserves that are uh, required on the system. And as you get into those reserves or get to the far end of, you know, you sort of depleting those reserves, that's when certain actions come online. And oftentimes we may, for example, be, let's just say, um, you know, planning a certain outage or a certain piece of maintenance. We're told, do not do that. You know, you have to be on. And, and so it's those kinds of things. It's there, I, I there's a, there's a lot of little things, but we, we, it was a good question and we don't often know. We're, we're in an emergency, but we actually don't, nothing changes. We're still- So maybe three hours a month. I don't, I mean, don't quote me because it's not no, often, no. it's um, not often, um, it, it's, it's not often three hours. Uh, you know, it's, it's minutes. Well, sometimes. three days for one hour. I, I, I don't, I don't. I don't want to characterize it as that because I, I, I couldn't I can't tell you. It's not okay. often I try to answer your question, but but it's. I'm but trying it's to say unknown. three hours for an hour is not bad. Thank you. Okay, if that that works for you, that's good. But it, it, I, it, there are times we probably aren't dispatched more than, I don't know, five hours in a year. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I really don't know. What has it been in the past, John? What was that? What has it been in the past? We, again, I mean, we don't know. That's what I'm trying to say. We tried to mine the data. We don't know when we are specifically dispatched for a particular reason. 
Um, we tried to give, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember, we gave some, we gave some indication. I got to look, I, bear with me. I'm going to try to find. But that's we, okay. If you don't know, that's fine. Let me ask another question, John. Sure, what, what level do you plan to keep uh, Wilder Lake at on an inflow um, outflow basis? Sure. That's a good question. So, um, all of our uh, all of our reservoirs have an operating range, um, and we're proposing that the target is is largely going to be a half a foot below that maximum. And the reason for that is because um, uh, I'm sorry. Here, I'm trying. Well, okay, I won't try. To, I was going to try to answer and look up the other question, but at the same time, but I won't do that. Um, uh, sorry, just a minute. Hey, maybe Jennifer, you can. In the meantime, look up. I think it's in our MOU. There was some reference that we put in there to the number of emergency hours historically, and I just can't remember what it was. Uh, if it was 22 hours in a year or something like that, I can't remember. But anyway, Bill. Um, so, um, so the target is is a specific elevation, but we have a bandwidth of a half a foot above or below not for discretionary generation or anything that that's independent that's the the bandwidth is more for um we we might have a good idea what the inflow is at the at the main stem gauge and the well up at wells river but there's a lot of reservoir and a lot of river between that gauge point and the dam and even though we say generally the water takes about eight hours to get from there to here, that's not always the case. It can be seven hours, it can be nine hours. You can get a rainstorm on the on Pompanoosic. You could have a lot of things sort of going on. And so the best way for us to manage inflow equals outflow is basically trying to hold to this target elevation. But we're doing that on, in, on an instantaneous basis. And we're doing it based on largely what we're anticipating that to be the day or even two days in advance because we have to bid our generation into the um you know the, the wholesale power market so we're gonna we're, we're we're doing sort of all we can to sort of understand sort of what the price curve looks like and the demand curve as well as inflow and then we'll put a schedule in so if we're really good or perfect, let's just say, we're gonna be spot on that target for all 24 hours, the next 24 hours. But it could easily be we're a 10th or two tenths off, maybe after a couple hours of, of the schedule. And so that, that bandwidth allows that to happen and allows us to sort of get back to the target when it's most appropriate. If, if we're slowly creeping off of the target, it may be better to just do it the next in the next day's schedule, or if it looks like we're kind of, you know, uh, getting farther and farther away from the target in a more rapid, then we would basically revise our schedule with the ISO and try to bring it back down to the target. But we, but you need some flexibility because you just you're just not going to be perfect, and we don't really want to operate at the maximum elevation. Because any time we're off, we're just going to have to spill it. You know, we're we're not going to be able to hold it back. So we need we're basically just keeping it about six inches below the maximum of elevation at every one of these three, you know, projects. Th does that answer your question? It does to some extent. Obviously, sometimes of the year there's a lot more water flowing down Lake Connecticut than other times of the year. So mm -hmm. it's going to take less time when there's more water to recover to your uh, target as opposed to when the dry year in august sometime uh, it may take you a lot longer to recover to your um target uh, yeah so no so, so that so no well i mean so you're, you're absolutely right um and but we're we're monitoring in terms of inflow equals outflow and that bandwidth that we have at above and below the target that's really not going to be affected by timing or flow it's going to be based on whether how accurate we are in terms of, of, of estimating. What, what you're speaking of ha has a lot of merit and bearing on whether or not we flex, we, we, we flex an, an hour. 
In other words, because we, let's just say whatever the flow is, and we want to flex, we want to flex the generation twice that flow, you know, twice the inflow or, or, or the hour before we have to ramp up to that. And then the hour or two after we have to ramp down and there's rates on that. And I, I was going to go into that specificity, but my point being is that um, there's a, there's a whole volume there of water that we know and we could we we would anticipate saying okay well we're going to flex in this hour this is sort of the amount of water and this is what we think we would end up drawing down the re the impoundment off of that um target now we've done a lot of this uh sort of modeling and we don't you know, you know we're not we haven't exhausted it but what 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 comes into play here in that decision making as to whether or not we should even flex that hour is number one the price at the moment, the price at the moment following the flexible hours when we have to refill. And so, and then obviously the amount of flow that's in the river. So um, the more the, the, the more the delta is between our flexible operation and the inflow, the more the pond will go down, the longer it's gonna take to refill. And we don't really wanna refill if the prices start coming back up. So we it's all that because then it then then all the gain that we might have had in the flexible one hour of flexible lock is lost because it's taking us whatever 12 hours to refill the reservoir a, a three or four tenths of a foot. And and that's what we're talking. We're not talking large drawdowns in any way, shape, or form because largely it's because it just takes too long to refill. And we don't want to refill at a, and we we're refilling by passing less than the inflow so essentially we're losing money if the prices start going up and so there's a whole there's like a little dynamic here and we didn't i i wouldn't i mean i i predicted it but i wouldn't have known exactly how it plays out so it's that sort of dynamic that we're looking at well what what's the price now what's what's the price going forward how long are is the price lower before it peaks comes back up because in the winter there are two high price hours in the day and we don't really want to be refilling at 70 percent of the flow and and losing that say second high price period in the day because it, it, it just it would just negate what we just did the hour you know the the period before so it's that whole dynamic that we're playing with here but ultimately what it means is that there's um the amount of draw, uh, the amount of impoundment um, movement at the dam when we flex is really limited than what we do today because um, we only have so many hours and there's a refill obligation and there's up ramping and down ramping and that all sort of goes into the equation. Sorry, I'm not sure that answered your question, but I, it's, 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 uh, it's a good question. Well, but well I think yeah. I think because the question comes from the experience we've had for the last 40 years of watching the river go up and down daily. And so the curiosity here is with your new proposal, mm -hmm. what will it look like under your new scenario in terms of daily fluctuations? 90% uh, of the time, it's going to be the same elevation. Okay. If that if that's the best way to put it. It's, probably, that, more, it's that, probably more than 90. Um, uh, but but it, it kind of depends on where you are. Um, we we're managing at the dam. If you have a farm in Newbury, you're not going to see so much of the dam's operation. Mm -hmm. You're going to see inflows operation, mm -hmm. and so that can change and will change and will continue to change. But it's not a function of this project. In fact, it's it now. As I mentioned way at the beginning, we are continuing to have our our high water management. So what's perhaps most you know recent in your mind was we had you know um, relatively high flows a couple of weeks ago, and we had uh, at the dam we had the dam uh, reduced at elevation. So in in fact, Kathy, you, you'd written me about it. Uh, uh, and it's not, everybody always writes me about it every year. Uh, uh, everybody says we've never seen it this low before, but they, I know they have because we do it every year. 
Um, but but essentially that operation called high water management, or we also call it river profile, is because there's so much water coming in upstream. We have to try to manage, rather than manage water at the dam, we're trying to manage that water coming in upstream. And so in order to do that, based on a certain anticipated inflow that's six hours away, we have an operating procedure that requires us to be at a certain elevation at the dam in order to essentially keep the water in its banks up above. That was part of the development of the project. So you, you might have seen in the last couple of weeks, there was some high, we had high rain or we had a period after high rain. I mean, I, I was in Vermont and I couldn't believe how much rain was in the mountains. And then I saw it in the White River and et cetera, et cetera. And I knew we were spilling. Um, and so if we're just barely spilling, we might be a half a foot down. If we're, you know, we've exceeded station capacity by about 10,000 CFS, which is not uncommon at all. We're at the bottom of our impoundment range, five feet below the maximum. And in doing so, up in Newbury, the water's still largely within its banks. Thank so you. that's that's a very different thing. That's more of a seasonal or high water type of thing rather than daily. So, um, so let me just. Uh, I mean, I, I uh, trying to think of how I can how to how to describe it. Again, the the primary mode is inflow equals outflow. We're going to maintain a stable water elevation with some allowance um, for these deviations or or basically unanticipated, you know, being being off on our, our anticipated flows. Um, the inflows are largely driven by the uh, operations that are upstream, and those continue to, um, they peak at the big plants, they peak less at the discharge at McIndoo's, but they, will, they won't be run a river. And so you will see some movement up and, up and down um, uh, at the upper end of the impoundment uh, but not so much uh, caused by our, the operation at the dam. And uh, the, the, our target is, is meant to be as high as reasonably possible because largely we just, you know, we, have, we don't gain anything when the reservoir is down, we, we lose energy. And so it doesn't, it doesn't behoove us to have it at a low elevation. Um, it's just that sometimes we have to for high water and sometimes it makes sense when we need to um, provide uh, a, a more maximum volume of energy during a specific hour. Um, and, and in doing so, by keeping the, the, the reservoir full, it will provide some storage for continued story, storage for this discretionary um, generation. And this is a really key thing, not for stakeholders so much, but for the ISO, because this is a really, what we're proposing for the ISO is basically a runner river operation for the most part, and yet we are we 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 we're proposing that we have full reserve capability, and largely it's because we have some flexibility, and we have this emergency you know uh, operation for the ISO, and we'll always have a full pond to be able to provide that. We're never going to be able to have an empty pond and say we can't generate for the five minutes because we don't have any water. So that's kind of an insurance for them to say, yeah, you, you do have this reserve capability. So it's, we, we found sort of a unique position, I believe, to, um, to, uh, to operate in. The change in, in what you see from our perspective is that the generation will be more round the clock, even, even across the hours. Uh, there'll be more generation in what we typically call the sort of the night or the non-peak hours, the weekend hours than currently. And so going back to you know, Bill's question, you're gonna see a much more sort of stable operation uh, during most of the year. In, in June, we only have, for example, 10 hours of flexible operation. And it could be in June that either the flows are so low or in May, the flows are so low, we also have 10, um, that we just can't, can't, you know, can't even afford to run a flexible hour because the, the refill would be too hard to to do. So you might not see even 10 hours used, potentially. Um, uh, let's just see. Um, in terms of like flexible operations, these are the sort of hours that we have during different months. So in December, January, and February, we'll have 65 hours of flexibility. 
a lot of species, a lot of life stages are sort of in a dormant mode. They're not, they're not exposed. You don't have uh, egg masses. You don't have uh, spawning going on. And then during more of a spawning or, or you, we have very much fewer hours. And then during the summer, um, actually this is old, this is now 42 hours. And I just, I didn't realize this was an old sheet. Um, we'll have uh, uh, 20 hours and then in November, there's kind of a, 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 a hybrid between 20 and 65. Um, uh, and we'll ba basically be doing this by scheduling it in the day ahead market. Um, so we have to try to, um, uh, you know, do the best we can to, to uh, estimate inflow. In fact, that's one of the elements, not really in our proposal uh, per se, but there are there are significant dollars that we're identifying. We're we're perhaps going to be, you know, uh, putting some instrumentation out there to have a better idea of what the intra impoundment flows are doing. Right now, we have an elevation at the dam. We have some gauge that might be upstream. We're going to try to have a better feel over time through maybe some instrumentation. And it, we're not, that's not designed yet, but it's our, our goal is to try to better estimate what inflow is going to be and when it's going to be at the dam um, than we do now. It, that's a, it's actually, you know, it's a pretty significant uh, element um, to try to get in place even before we start to operate so that we know we can do it. We know we can do it in theory. Doing it in practice is what we're we're more we're more um, concerned about. Sorry, um, John. Go ahead. Great question. Sure. Um, uh, for sure. you, who, I just just who sorry, uh, Eric. Sorry, Eric. Nope. There you go. Yeah, there. You go. <laughs> okay, Eric. Sorry. No worries. Yeah. Um, you said from um, July to October it was not twenty hours flex, but. I missed what you actually said. This was old data. What is it actually? Uh, this right here is is really, I think it's. Oh, November is pending. I think it's 42 hours. OK. It, it isn't pending. It just is pending on this old um, text that I cobbed off another <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. OK, uh, yep. No, thanks. That answers that right my there. question. Thank you. And and it's and it's a uh, it's kind of uh, um, it's spread in the month, like I think there's, I can't remember, but I'm thinking it's 15 hours. Maybe it's 10 or maybe it's 15. Do you remember, Jen? I don't, I have to look it up, but it's, I think it's even 10. I think it's 10 hours uh, in the uh, first uh, 15 days. And then. Uh, yes, I think it's 10 and a total of, total of 15. I think it's 10 in the first 15 days, and it's a total of 42 in a month. Hmm. And that's because there are some species that, depending on the kind of the, the particular year, they may not be fully uh, buried in the mud or whatever it might be in that, until the uh, middle of November. So that's what that's about. Um, OK. Uh, Again, so uh, when I was talking to you about these different transition periods, um, so uh, we would have in our schedule, you know, that we're designing the day ahead, uh, we would say, okay, like, you know, our six o'clock at night, this is, we, we think this is the right time to use a flex hour in this particular month. And that means at five, in the five o'clock hour, we have to, generate halfway between what inflow is and what we anticipate the flex generation to be. And then the hours after the um, flex hour, we're, we're decreasing the rate of discharge 70% uh, each hour. And then uh, once that 70% is um, of, of the previous hour reaches or gets to where it will be matching inflow, then we can either pass inflow or begin to refill. And when we refill, we're passing 70% of inflow, not 70% of the hour before. So we're actually passing less than inflow. So that's how we're sort of doing it. It's like, it's like it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's really good on a really perfect simulator, but other than that, <laughs> this is a lot of, uh, there's gonna be a lot of challenges here. Um, but, but, but we think it's reasonably doable. And as long as it's reasonable and we have some bandwidth, um, 
it's going to be remarkably different than what you see today. Because today, we can basically go, if we want to, we don't typically go from 700 CFS minimum flow to 9,000, but we'll often go from 700 to three or to four and a half, you know, or, or, or you know, 4,500 CFS. You won't see that today um, in the, or going forward. You, you just won't see it. We're, we're getting close to uh, running out of time. Are there other questions from, from uh, commissioners? I, I have one. Um, so some of the newer members may not may not be aware that when we when this group commented on the Rosen studies, we pretty specifically asked for consideration of less frequent and smaller changes in the water surface elevation. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is is what we asked for. And I wanted I wanted to be sure that people are aware of that. Mm -hmm. We're most of us just kind of educated lay people in this science though. Um, and I'm assuming that there are gonna be studies of the impacts to see if kind of our gut feelings were right about, you know, this improving the erosion situation and whatnot. Are you are you proposing to, to sponsor some of those studies going forward? Well, um, no, uh, we're not going to do any studies, um, Tara. What we've done is we've done all the studies and, and, and that in part is what led to this proposal. You see, no, kind of the I, other way around. What I what I meant was, um, I would imagine that there are going to be a lot of interest in studying the improvements, right? Looking. looking we're we're not going to be studying the improvements. No, no. no that's not in our paleo week at all. Um, I, I mean, to be honest with you. Um, we did a lot of studies. We did in close to, uh, I would say, in studies, probably $10 million worth of studies. And many of those studies were in aquatic, um, you know, habitat or aquatic r resource impacts associated with our uh, project operations. And I would say that um, very few of those studies pointed to this operation. Very few. What they did is they basically didn't point to any operation uh, that was the same for one species or one aquatic resource or another. Like some in, some might have been, some resources might have been improved by ramping. Some might have been improved by higher flows. Some might have been improved by higher minimum flows. There's a lot of things that could have occurred. And so the the most um, the 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 what what everybody sort of came you know, to Jesus on was that perhaps the easiest way for us to sort of find the best pathway for all of these resources, because we studied a ton of different species and life stages, et cetera, is to try to make the river more naturalized, more in terms of natural behavior. And um, there are definitely species that, you know, or especially young of life that are, 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 are not going to see the same habitat they exist in today. But they might not be impaired. They just, they might have a new area, a new section of the river that they're going to sort of occupy within the wetted channel, but it's going to stay that way more often. And so that there, there might be a benefit in the, in the long run, even though there might be, a, you could say that there's a, they, that, that, that shift in our operation did affect that species at, at a certain life stage. So um, in terms of, uh, you mentioned erosion, which I'll just briefly touch on. Um, again, uh, we are uh, we are very uh, adamant that um, there is um, there is uh, erosion occurring on the river, but it's not due to our operation. Now, people may disagree with that, but uh, our studies that we did uh, largely point to the transport of sediment and the mobilization of sediment is at flow rates that are higher than our operation. In other words, high flow is causing erosion like it has for 10 millennium. Now, to the extent that people believe that our operation and the fluctuation of a couple feet or a foot and a half is the primary response, you know, the, the cause of erosion, you won't see that fluctuation. And so they should be happy but we don't believe we ever was were causing the erosion that those folks were thinking we were causing. 
that's the best way to sort of answer that yeah. particular resource issue. Any other questions yes. for uh, John? Yes. Um, I heard you say that most of the studies are done. Um, there well, they are, are all done. <laughs> okay. They're, they're all there, done. There are yeah. some yeah. people yeah. relatively close to Wilder Dam who are, come, who are saying that they are doing an archaeological dig kind of thing. But they're not um, connected. You're saying they're not connected to you. Uh, well, I'm not sure. You're, you're saying that there are there is currently some archaeological uh, investigation going on near the dam. Yes. Well, it's you're not... up up in Wilder. So, yeah, that's, that's I'm, above the dam. We're we're not doing any. Uh, okay. at this moment okay. uh, we 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 are going to continue to try and um seek landowner permission uh, to look at some areas that we had identified in very in, along the banks in certain areas we couldn't get a landowner permission and we we basically said we'll, we'll continue to try to get landowner permission but there's a lot of landowners that have not given us permission to look at for stuff in their land yeah that's because maybe they don't want to know what's in their land you know what i mean they don't I, I don't know why, um, but uh, but but there's none being proposed and none occurring right now, Lynn. Yeah. And, uh, as far as I know, Jen, I don't think we have, have any. No, I'm not aware of any that we're doing no, in no. Wilder right now. We, we, it, we do... it sounded like a strange story. Well, it could, no, no, it, it very much could be. We always are having, like say, for example, um, let, let's just say one of our proposals is going to be to, um, you know, improve the, Portage Trail, let's just say. Well, when we improve the Portage Trail, we will investigate if there are any resources in the area where we put a shovel in. That's basically par for the course. Whenever we put a shovel in the ground, we investigate, or whenever we potentially impact uh, by moving a trail or something like that, we look at whether or not there's an impact on, on historic culture resources. Sorry, one more quick question, John, if, if it's sure. okay. This is Eric yeah. again. Okay with me. Yeah. Yep. Um, so for these four different scenarios that you laid out. Um, like the, the modes, you mean? Like in our Yeah, operation. so you have the inflow, yeah. outflow, mm -hmm. flexible, mm -hmm. transition, and then sure. the emergency. Yeah. Um, how do you log these? So how do we see, like, for example, how many hours were spent in flexible or if there was a transition or if an emergency was actually in, in effect? Um, well, I mean, uh, we, 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 I can't really tell you exactly um, how that's going to be because we're not, we're not being asked to do that, but we anticipate we're going to be asked to show that. Um, so currently, typically, we, will, we provide hourly information to our state regulators and to FERC. So it'll be something along those lines. We'll, we'll, we'll be giving them not copies of our logs, but basically data, hourly data, and, and our our expectation is that we'll have to identify, you know, what the inflow is, what our anticipated inflow is. Uh, you'll have elevations of the dams. When we've counted one as a flex operation, theoretically the flow would be higher than the inflow, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be some means of sort of marking those times, for lack of a better way to put it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Now that's not, I mean, it's not that you can't get it. We're not posting it for the public. We we provide that to our regulators. Yeah. Okay. It's not that you might not be able to get it from them, but we don't distribute it to just anybody. Okay. Just because it'd be a nightmare to do that. But but it's a but you could probably get it from them if you were interested. I had I had another question on the last line on your last slide. Um, it says um, with granting or waiving the 401. That's the first I've heard that there's a possibility of the 401 permits being waived. Can you Well we we think that's a we think that's remote to none, to be honest with you. But that is a provision. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it is a provision. And and uh uh so for example uh in my last relicensing the project spanned the Connecticut River. One state waived and the other didn't and it's because one state just participated in the other, the other states 401. So it was just a process thing and they decided not to. Um, or they, 
you know, you might have an amendment uh, in, in one we, we, we rebuilt Vernon a number of years ago and uh, the, the Vermont waived the, the 401 requirement for that amendment because it, it didn't, it, it wasn't needed for the scope of the work kind of thing. Um, for these projects, we do not anticipate them being waived and we anticipate both states requiring a 401 as they've indicated to us. But that, but it is, it is part of the, the the rule. They have a year to either waiver issue. Hi, John. Chet Clem here. I apologize in advance if I missed something. I had to track down a kid who had escaped from bedtime. Um, but regarding the existing recreation facility improvements and enhancements, mm -hmm. can you speak to how much of that is just enhancing existing facilities versus it's, it's, opportunities for additional recreational improvements? Um, we are not expanding our recreational opportunities um, beyond the footprints of our existing facilities. Yeah, we may modify them, we may improve them, but we're not. We have um, FERC is very particular on what is in your project boundary and what you're um, what you're proposing in your application. It has to be within the project boundary. Um, these facilities are in our project boundary, and this is what we're proposing. We have, for example, you know, there have been whatever, there's, uh, you know, canoe campsites that are along the Connecticut River. Uh, the ones that are within our project boundary that we sponsor, those are being incorporated. So there is, I guess, technically, there's a little bit of an expansion of what we currently have in our project would be those few areas that we have just historically managed. Those are now going to be within our project um, because they lie on project land but that's the extent of the expansion element. All right, John, Jennifer, thank you very much for uh, meeting with us tonight and uh, presenting the Great Hydro Project. Yeah, and, and, and if there's any follow-up questions or something like that, just, you know, Tara or Olivia, just send us and we'll try to we'll give do. you some answer back or something like that. I, I have the information about the uh, emergencies and how oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are, I have a table. I don't know if it's easier to send the table to you, but um, I can uh, quickly go through. Uh, we looked at, do you want me to go through or do you want? I, I would just try to summarize it in terms of that number. I, I don't, I don't want to, I really would prefer not to say that if we gave them a table of when they occurred, this is what it would be going forward. I think we tried to characterize it, I think in that. Yeah. Part. So between 2014 yeah. and 2018, um, there was a round in, in the New England area, 2014, there were 20 and that was the highest. And then every other year it was two or three. Yeah. Um, and then local events, um, which would have been local to the projects between zero and eight um, and ranging from maybe 20 minutes to five minutes. So, so they're, they're, they're relatively small. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Good. Again, thank you very much for uh, your presentation tonight. Okay. Thank uh, you. Have a good evening good. and good. We're, we're all set, I guess. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Talk thank to you tomorrow, Jen. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.